May God bless you. Now, today we are so uh, blessed to have a friend of a friend of mine, a friend of ours. And um, I know most of you know Pastor Jeremiah. Uh, Pastor Jeremiah was involved, uh, has been involved in ministry for many years in Kenya. Actually, he goes once a year to minister to uh, many people in Kenya. And uh, I also want you to know that if you have not been coming to the prayer meeting, you've also missed a lot because um, Mama Dennis has been a great blessing teaching us the word of God. I'm excited every time uh, Mama Dennis is, is ministering to us through Zoom because I know there's going to be a fresh word from the Lord. Amen. And so, Mom, we appreciate you. We also appreciate you, Pastor Jeremiah. And as you come to share the word of the Lord, why don't we all welcome him with a hand up, please? And uh, so that he can come and minister the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Yes. Uh... It's another good day that the Lord has enabled us to be in his presence. And, and this is the doing of the Lord. It is not because of our zeal or anything. It is God. First of all, allow me to apologize because last Sunday, I heard that I was supposed to minister, but there was a breakdown in communication. Because today and next Sunday is when I knew I'm going to be off. And uh, I talked to the, uh, to the pastor before that, and I told him that um, whenever I get a chance to, to start here or to minister, I will speak or I will teach on how to study the word of the Lord, studying the Bible. Because it's very important for us to know how to study the Bible simply because most of us, since we got saved, we were not guided on how to study the Word of God. And I'm going to read the scripture from the book of 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. That Paul, the Apostle Paul, was exhorting Timothy on how to go about it. And he said, Stand there to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that need not to be ashamed, lightly dividing the word. Stand there to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, lightly dividing the word of truth. We are told that what this scripture means, lightly defining the word of truth, is like drawing a line that will separate something into two equal parts. That is the Greek word that is used there, drawing a line. And maybe in the language that we can understand, it means the balance, balancing the scripture. I have heard of so, some religions that call themselves Jesus only, or Jesus and the Father and whatever. And by so doing, they don't balance the trinity of God, which is God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And again, in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for collection, for instruction, and light, uh, in righteousness. So today, it's not going to be a normal day because I'm going to teach, and whatever a teacher is teaching, it's, it's okay if you can be able to ask a question because I also will be asking some questions. When I'm preaching here, there's no way you can ask me, hey, stop, 
and you ask me a question. Even though you may have a question, but you cannot do that. But let me say this. I like teaching the word of the Lord more than anything else. More than anything in the ministry. And if I may give you my background, when I was in Migori, in my early years of ministry, I was able to invest a lot of money in library. So even when I went to Bible school, I was, I didn't see the need of going to the library of the Bible school because I had enough that was helping me in any subject or in any topic that I wanted to study. And some of those books, I still have them. I gave some. Others were stolen. And I still have others. Some I gave, they never came back. Some people borrowed, they never brought it back. And this also reminds me of a story of a young boy that was in school with a teacher. And they, they were in the mathematics class. And the teacher was asking him, your father went to so and so and borrowed this amount. And again, he went to so and so and borrowed this other amount. Now, how much will your father pay all together? And the boy said courageously, zero. And the teacher thought like the boy was crazy. He doesn't know what he was saying. And he asked again, this is what I am asking you. That your dad got this amount from so and so. And he got this amount from so and so. How much is he going to, to pay? The boy said zero. And then he said, teacher, you don't know my dad. I know my dad more than anybody else, more than you. When my dad borrows, he doesn't pay. This is how I lost. This is how I lost some of the books. Because some people borrowed after today. They never paid it back. I don't know if you are like that. That dad of the young boy. When you borrow, make sure you pay back. And sometimes people don't value books. So you give him a book, but to, to him, it's, it's, it's nothing. It's, it's not of value. So he does not consider to bring it back to you. Not that he is stealing from you, but he does not consider that it is of great value. But if there is something that is of value, it is a book. And for those people that know or understand books, and I'm sorry sometimes because you visit some houses, you don't even find a single book in the bookshelf. And even the Bible, you just find the small Bible, the New Testament. Which, of course, they did not buy. It was donated by Gideons. Come on. We've got to invest in the word of God. We have to invest in the word of God. The amount I had spent, I could have been able to buy a personal car, to be honest. Or a prod. But I decided to go the other way. And I purchased all those books that a certain bishop who was able to go to, to UK, this place had acquired hundreds of books. I was able to acquire. And even up to today, I do not regret for that kind of investment. So this is what Paul is instructing Timothy to stand the word of God to show himself a workman that needs not to be ashamed, literally dividing the word. Sometimes uh, a preacher will preach, 
But for those that know the word of God, they will be ashamed. Simply because it's like another story of a young man that went to church and when he went home, he was very much discouraged. And I believe I've given this story before. And when he was asked why he was discouraged, he said, because the preacher did not tell us to do anything to our God. That was the cause of his discouragement. So we need to study the word of the Lord. And I'm, this morning, I'm going to show you how to study the word of the Lord. And I may suggest that if it's possible that you have a pen and a paper or just not some of things in your phone, in your notebook, because they are not common. Because once you come across them in the future, you will not stumble by thinking, hey, this is a very big vocabulary. I have never heard of it. And where are we supposed to stand in the Bible? That's another question. Where? We are to stand in the word of the Lord from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. There was a problem in some of the early churches because they taught the rate, the congregations, that the word of the Lord cannot be understood by the rate, but just by the clergy. It was a mistake. Because so long as you have the Holy Spirit of God, you will be able to understand the word of the Lord because he is the one who, in, who, who will interpret whatever you read to you. And he will give you revelation. Even some of the things that or some of the revelations that others have never come with, you will be given by that Holy Spirit. This morning I attended Bible study. I usually attend Bible study in Fawn Baptist. We have a class, like today we were 26, of most people are elderly people. And the teacher was teaching about the resurrection of Jesus. And we came to a praise that he said, when Jesus was buried, and the lock, the stone was lowered by his, by his grave, and there was a seal, it was sealed, and not what? The seals during those times were gotten from the kings. It is a sign that that one has not been tampered with. So that one was a sign that nobody else is there but Christ. And he said, the teacher said, that I am sure that those guards, those soldiers that were guarding that grave must have lost their life. Later on, I raised my arm and said, before we can continue, can I say something? I don't think so. I don't think that they lost their lives. Simply because the Bible tells us that when Christ arose and the grave was empty, that the high priest gave money to the guards and said, just say that you slept. And the disciples came and stole, took away his body. So the guards or, the, or the, the government was not against the guards because they were supporting the claim that Jesus has not listened. So there is no way they could have killed them. And again, when Jesus died, all the world knew and they confessed that surely he was the son of God. Because the graves shook, the whole world shook, there was darkness during the day. What else? Some of the dead people that had died were seen 
walking in the city of Jerusalem. So they knew that this was not an ordinary person. But he was God. He was Christ, the son of the living God. And then we continued. Everybody was silent. They saw the sense behind that. Why? Because I have studied that story. What about if I had not studied? When you do not study, and that is where the problem is, you swallow whatever is brought to you. And you, some of these things, you may think they are liberation, but they are not, because they are not in accordance with the word of God. So, just as I said, we need to understand from, to read from, to study from Genesis to Revelation. It is simply because where we are in right now and what is going on right now, we may not know if we do not know the history. And where we are going, we are not going to know if we have not read the eschatological books. Eschatology is the science of the future, is the study of the future events. Let me pause there and let me ask you a question. Right now, just, the pastor just prayed for the wall in Gaza. Why? Okay, how did it begin? Anybody with an idea? And I say this is Bible study, so we're going to contribute. Okay, before maybe you say, Oh, do it. Is there anybody that you want to, to tell us how it, it started? Yes, and taking others captive, right? Yes. Why did they do this? This is rumors. Don't ask me where I read it. Because I read it, it's not inspired. I read it from some people. And they said, the reason why Hamas did that is because Israel acquired five red havers. What are havers in the Bible? Young cows. Now, in the book of Numbers 19, verse 1 to 3, I will read. You don't have to go to that. But let me just read. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord had commanded, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring thee a red haver without spot, wherein there is no blemish, and upon which never came yoke. Verse 3. And he shall give her unto Elias the priest that he may. Bring forth young, bring forth, okay, let me read first three again. And he shall give her unto Elias the priest, that he bring, bring her forth without the camp, outside the camp, I mean. And one shall stray before his face. So, it is said that this was an ordinance, and of course it was, and an ordinance in the Bible, it is something that was not done once, but something that the people of Israel had to live with. That is why we have the baptism. It's an ordinance. That's why we have the Lord's Supper. It's an ordinance. It is something to be continued. So in this case, it is something that was supposed to be continued. I don't know for how long they discontinued this. But it is suggested that they want to go before the Lord with a sin offering, because this was a sin offering, that the Lord may have mercy on them and forgive their sins. And they have constructed an altar Close to where 
the temple was a magnitude, an altar of a great magnitude. And that is why where they will sacrifice those lead havers without the spot. And it's not far from... Okay, let me go back a little bit. This place right now is occupied by the Muslim community. In fact, there is the mosque that they call the Dome of the Rock. But guess what? According to the Bible, there is what we call the Millennium Temple, Millennium Temple. And it will be where, I mean, the same place where Solomon's temple stood. What other temple in the Bible? How many temples we have in the Bible? We have Sol Solomon's temple. We have Zerubbabel's temple. The temple they built after the Babylonian captivity, it is not the Solomon's temple, but it is changed. And we call it Zerubbabel's temple. And again, we have the Herod's temple. This was a temple when Jesus was there. And in fact, it was of great magnitude. And people were surprised when Jesus was telling them that there is no stone that is going to be left on top of the other. They, they did not understand what it meant. Because it was a magnificent temple. But in the year 70 AD, that temple was destroyed and it came to nothing. Later on is when this mosque was built. So I'm looking at the near future to see Israel recapturing this venue because it is a holy ground to them. It is a holy ground to the Muslim. It is a holy ground to the Jewish. It is a holy ground even to Christians. So, and what will happen? We may not know what will happen, but all I know is that God, the God of Israel, is behind Israel, and he will do it himself. He will accomplish all these things. Because nobody can stop an idea whose time has come. God will do it himself. Now, look at where Israel is. Compared to other nations, it's just like a spot. Muslims capture northern, you know, all those sites of Arabia, whatever, North Africa, all those, they have captured a lot. But they are not able to shake these small people, the people of Islam. Why? The God, the Father, is behind them. And when God is with you, nobody can be against you. They are not going to prevail. They will kill one, but they will die a hundred. Because this battle is not theirs. The battle belongs to the Lord. And that's why you have a say, song saying that in heavenly armor we enter the Lord, the battle belongs to the Lord. Because if it were not for this Lord, even we, where could we be? We could have been defeated many years ago. We could have gone long time ago. But the battle belongs to the Lord. Now, when we come to study the Bible, something else we need to understand is this. We have historical books. We call them like the prophets, those most of the Old Testaments are historical books. We also have the prophets. And when it comes to the prophets, 
we have the major prophets and the minor prophets. The major prophets or the minor prophets, let me talk about the minor prophets, it's not because the information they had was minor compared to the information that was with the major prophets. But the only difference is that the major prophets had details when the minor prophet does not. That's why you see some of the prophets, they have like one chapter or two or three chapters. Whereby somebody like Isaiah, he has how many chapters? Sixty what? Six or six? What about Jeremiah? What about Daniel? What about Ezekiel? That is why they are major prophets. Not because of the information. So whenever you are reading the Bible and you see a short book, don't say, ah, this one is not much. This one is just minor. It is not minor. Even in the New Testament, we have books that has only one chapter. Like Philemon. I was teaching that book the other day in, in our uh, Bible study in Phony. And I came to fire to see that that book is very rich. Even though it's a single chapter, but it's a rich book. And if you remove that book, it's just like removing a section in a movie. Everything else will be altered. So, we need to understand all these things. Also, we need to understand that we have what we call the wisdom literature. How many books are there in the wisdom literature? Proverbs? Huh? Ecclesiastes? Song of Solomon? Hmm? How many have we, have, have we said so far? We have you forget one. The, the most important book and the oldest books. It's not even Psalms. The oldest book in the Bible. Which one is that? Good. Job falls into this category of the wisdom books. We have Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, and Ecclesiastes. And now when you come to the New Testament, you need to understand how you are studying it. First of all, we have the Gospels. You may think that there is a discrepancy. First of all, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. What do we call them? Baba Jaroge, answer that. You have not forgotten. Good. What does that mean? <laughs> Some of us have never heard of that. Synoptic Gospels. And I'll explain what it means. Synoptic gospel means that those people see that story in the same view. Synopsis, synoptic, in the same view. The one that is different is the gospel of John. He has a different view. He has others things that the others didn't see. But all is the word of God. And then also, we have the epistles. The epistle of Paul, like whatever you just read, to Timothy, whatever. Waraka, Amabarua, whatever we may say. We call them the epistles. And also, we have the book of Revelation, which we call an eschatological book. Eschatology is a word that I have just said. It is the art of studying the future. And there are people that God has gifted to understand the future. They are gifted in this area of whatever eschatology. Now, when we come to study the Bible, first of all, there are questions 
that we need to ask. Okay, before I go, uh, go to that one, let me say this. Apart from that, apart from those books in the Bible, there are others that helps us to understand the word of God. Don't ignore them. Yes, they are not inspired, but they are there to help us. For example, a Bible dictionary, it is important. A Bible concordance, it is important. Poreos, dictionary, concordance, and a Bible commentary, they are important. For example, there is what we call the, Ma the Matthew Henry commentary of the Bible, of the whole Bible. He was a rich guy as far as the word of God is concerned. And if we study through his studies, through his help, we can be somebody. Paul, the apostle, became somebody not because of the revelation that he got when he was going to persecute the church, because he himself had studied under Gamaliel. Gamaliel was a doctor of the law, and he was a member in the Sanhedrin. In Acts chapter, is it chapter whatever, chapter 5, uh, if I'm not long, there was a time that came and they arrested the apostles, and they took them before the, 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 the Sanhedrin, and they wanted to kill them. They wanted to kill them. And these men stood with authority. He said, I, he was a man of authority. And he said, let these people be removed for a time. And when they were removed for a time, he talked to this council of the Sanhedrin and he gave them two or yeah, two examples of people who rose and they had one of them had three four, 300 followers and when he died everybody else left. Another one, Judas of whatever, he had another congregation that followed him and when he died everything was forgotten and so he told them if this work is from God, you're not going to prevail. Otherwise, you find yourself fighting against God. But if it is for man, if it's from man, just give it a time. It will no more be found. And the congregation, I mean the Sanhedrin, this council of the Sanhedrin, they felt that there was sense in this guy, Gamaliel. Gamaliel taught Paul before conversion because Paul was a Pharisee. He knew much about the role. So when he came to the gospel, that ideas or those ideas or that knowledge was just transformed and he became of great benefit to the church. So when he told them that, they just called them back, eaten them, and they sent them home. And the Bible says that they went home rejoicing for being found worthy to suffer for his name's sake. Praise be to God. My time is almost over, but let me continue a little bit. Something else we need to know when studying the Bible is what we call the principles of understanding the Bible. Write this word if you are noting it. Hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is H-E-R-M-E-N-E-U-T-I-C-S. It is the principles of interpreting the word of God. Because most people that does not understand hermeneutics, they interpret the scripture the way they want it to be interpreted. They don't use what we call exegesis. Exegesis 
is another term that means drawing away or drawing out of the scripture. But they use the opposite of exegesis. They use what we call exegesis, which is putting their ideas in the scriptures and believing that that is what it means. And I give an example. In the Bible, and I'm not ashamed to say that because I'm preaching, in the book of Genesis, we are told that Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit. But there are people that will interpret that any other whatever, trying to explain what the, 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 the fruit was, the fruit that was in the center, the center of the garden. I don't, uh, you know what I'm talking about. That is not hermeneutics. Neither is it exegesis. And the other term I want us to see is the term homiletics. Homiletics is now how to communicate, how to preach that truth that you have gotten from the Bible. Without putting your own ideas. I know it's not only me, but I know you have heard people reading the scripture from the book of Isaiah that when King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Is, is it Isaiah 6 or 5? 6. I saw the Lord. Some preachers preach. In order for you to see the Lord, Uzziah has to die. That is out of context. What they don't understand is that this Uzziah was a man of God. He was a man of God. In fact, he was one of the successful leaders in Israel. But the Bible is not talking about why, why Isaiah saw the rod. It's because Uzziah died, but it is a time factor. When? And this is something that is very important. There are questions that we need to ask ourselves whenever we are, we are studying the scripture. One of these questions is, who was it written to? This chapter that I'm reading, this book, this whatever, who was it written to? That is number one. What was the aim? What was the purpose of writing this book? Number three, when was it written? Like in this case, it was when Isaiah saw the road. It is the year that King Uzziah died. It's just like I can say, when President Moy died, I came to America. But does that not mean that President Moy is the one who had hindered me from coming to America? I'm talking about the year. There are so many exam examples that I can give, but I will not give for now. But we need to ask ourselves these questions in order for us to understand the word of God. Something else very important is what we call the context. We are not allowed to get a portion of scripture out of context. For example, one man said that he is going to, to read the scripture and what the scripture tells him to do, he will do it. But he did not understand of how to study the word of God in context. So he first of all went to look to the book of Matthew 27, verse 5, don't read, but there is a portion of scripture, is a there is a text that says that and Judas hung, hanged himself. 
Judas went and hanged himself. And then he said, oh, the Lord is telling me to go and, harm, uh, and hang myself. But before I do that, I will read another verse. He led John 10, verse 37. There is a section that, that says, Go and do likewise. And then, he read the third one. And maybe, maybe he said, oh, let me read the, the third one because three witnesses are two. And he led John 13, verse 26. What you want to do, do it quickly. He went and hanged himself. We also have some other examples in the Bible of people that preaches that there is no God. In Psalms 53, and another verse there, Psalms 53, one there, whatever, a fool says in his heart, there is no God. So he'll just start there. There is no God. The Bible says there is no God. But if you may ask him, who says there is no God? Is a fool. So are you not a fool by saying there is no God? So, I'm talking about the context. Sometimes back, it's not a long time ago, in, a, in our other fellowship, one of our brother's students, he preached on, uh, and I'm not criticize, criticizing, I'm just giving an example, in the book of Amos 10, verse 15, and he put the emphasis in verse 12, that says the Lord, as the shepherd take, takes out of the mouth of the lion two legs, or a piece of the ear, so shall the children of Israel be taken out that dwell in Samaria in the corner of a bed and in Damascus in a coach. So he was telling us, and it was powerful by the way, he was telling us, it does not matter what is remaining, even if it's an ear or two legs, because that is whatever, whatever is, is saying. But still God can do something, which is light, which is of course. But the context of this scripture is the judgment upon the children of Israel because, verse 10 says, for they know not to do right, says the Lord, who store up violence and robbery in their, press, in their palaces. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, and adversary, there shall be even allowed about the rod, and he shall bring down the strength of thee, and thy palaces shall be spoiled. So let me not read the whole thing. But the context was the judgment upon God's people, what, which was irreversible when time comes. Because most of us here have, have been shepherds in one way or the other. Maybe you used to, to look for your dad's goats or your grandfather's goats or whatever, or cows. But if you find a lion has eaten one of them and only the ears are left and the feet, you will agree with me that there is no hope of reselecting that. Unless by divine power, but there is no hope of Reselecting that. And again also, there is another scripture in the book of Joshua 5, verse 2. And in that time, the Lord said un, unto Joshua, make these sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. When I was leading, I was hey, to be circumcised the second time? Where? But if you read the context, you'll see that Israel were circumcised in the wilderness. And this time, the generation that was circumcised was already dead. So not those people that were circumcised are going to be circumcised again 
But it is those people that were there and they were not circumcised during the former circumcision. Those were the people that were to be circumcised again. Five more minutes. So, we have to understand the context. When you, when you are going to sleep, don't just let that verse and, 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 and just, just go, go away and think you have forever. You have to compare it with other verses and whatever to see the meaning of that. That is why you see even some people, they have false doctrine because they stood with just one verse in the Bible and they built the doctrine there. That is why you see some people do not even ask when they are told, God says, thus, thus, thus says the Lord. They just believe. You have to judge everything with the word of God. We have heard of somebody by name Jones. He told people, hey, drink poison. The Lord says that drink poison. You are awaited in heaven. And another one, he, he said, God is saying that we burn ourselves. He is waiting us in heaven. Maybe they just stood with one portion of the Bible and they were not questioned. Even prophecy, when you understand the word of God, you will be able to judge prophecy because every Christian has a God-given right to judge prophecy no matter or regardless of who has that prophecy. Well, I heard a lot, but I will stop it there for today. But let me conclude by this, saying this. When you study the Bible sometimes, you come through difficult portions of scripture. What you do or what you need to do is to keep those portions of scripture aside and continue enjoying the other scriptures. The greatest preacher in London, his name is Charles Handon Spurgeon, says it very clearly that when you come across such a verse, it is just like somebody who is eating a fish. When you are eating a fish and you come across a difficult, I mean, and come across a bone, you don't throw the whole fish away. But you keep the, the, the bone aside and you continue enjoying your fish. This is how it is, even with the scriptures. Some time ago, I had last time, I wanted to preach about the zeal of the Lord. And I went to, to the etymology of that word, and I found that the zeal of the Lord and the jealous of the Lord, jealous, God is a jealous God. That is what he says, that they are very the same. They are almost the same in the Greek language. So I was not able to know what scriptures I would start for, but I just kept them aside. Again, in 1 Corinthians 15, 29, Paul, uh, Paul is asking, if he's preached, talking about the resurrection, like we were doing this morning, and he is asking, if Jesus did not resurrect, then what will happen to those that are baptized for the dead? That is hard to be baptized for the dead. It is a difficult scripture. So may the Lord help us to understand how we will know him through the study of his word. And by so doing, we will not be led astray. I've had preachers preach, uh, preaching uh, like if you want the blessings of Psalms 35, you got to give 35 dollars. And some people give. I'm sorry if you come to me for that. I will not. I will not give a coin because of that. And again, let me say this as I conclude. We the Pentecostals, when it comes to the prosperity gospel, we are most affected. 
because we don't really understand the word of God. So, there is a story that what the Pentecostals do, those one of prosperity, whatever the church gives, they put it up, they draw it up and they say, what goes to heaven is what belongs to God. But what comes down is mine. When you throw it that, how much will go to heaven? Zero. So they get everything. Others of the main denominations, they set a line here and they say, whatever falls on this side is mine. Whatever goes on this side belongs to God. So in, they are in a better position. They are in a better position. So we error because of not knowing the scriptures. Praise be to God. So the reason why we, the only thing we can be able to, es to escape those is studying the scriptures and even comparing fast by fast and by so doing also, we can be able to defend the scriptures. If you, if you hear somebody saying, the Bible says that, you can be able to stand with courage and say, this is not what the Bible says. The Bible says A, B, C, D. Do we have any question? I say this Bible study, I'll give you a second to ask a question before I sit down. Let us pray. Mighty Father, I want to bless you. Thank you for your word this morning, O oh God. Father, how we pray that you help us to understand and to study your word, O oh Jehovah God. That we can be meet for your standard, O oh God. Even be able to preach the gospel and to defend the gospel into this world, O oh God. May you help us, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name I pray and believe. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Can you give Jesus a good hand? <laughs> you know why I'm laughing is today was unexpected. 